Touch it. Feel it here. Good. Okay, well, good morning. We have with us the two representatives of the film In Fabric, which is competing in the official section of the San Sebastian Film Festival. We've got the producer, Andy S Andrew Stark, and the director and scriptwriter, Peter Strickland. We've just seen the film, and I'm not too sure whether you've got any questions. I think it's a film that will bring about a lot of questions, I imagine. Give the microphone to the guy in the front row there, please. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't hear him. I can't hear him. Tell him I can't hear him. Oh, now I can. Oh, I like your film very much, by the way. I want to ask the director. Your films are quite different. They are groundbreaking sort of films, as was a type of films of the 1970s or the early 80s. I'd like to know, what type of references have you used vis-a-vis -vis that sort of cinema and the, uh, the, the, the horror genre, and what references have you had the film? And I take advantage, I saw in the credits, Ben Whitley as executive producer. I'm not too sure whether you'd worked before together or, or with as your first collaboration with him. First. <laughs> you go first. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, Keenholz was a big influence on this film. The, the sculptor, he, not always, but he made a lot of mannequins with a lot of resin dripping down their faces, which kind of hark back to my childhood. Um, I used to do, I ended up in a lot of shops as a kid, you know, ladies' department stores, a lot of mannequins with very thin, long fingers. Um, now I used to have a lot of nightmares about mannequins and Keenholz. When I thought I got over it, Keenholz came along and just brought it all back. Um, so I think he was a huge influence. I mean, I, I'm aware there's a lot of talk about Jello, um, which is ob obviously it's a good thing like whenever, whenever that's mentioned. But it wasn't, I mean, I, I, I love, you know, Martino, Argento, Bava, all those people. But um, it, wasn't, it wasn't at the forefront of my mind, maybe subconsciously that came into it. But to be honest, it was, it was uh, it was these department stores in, I don't know about Spain, but in, in the UK, um, they were out of time. They were like strange other worlds. They were not like your chain shops. Um, so you'd see this dumb waiter and with the clothes coming up and you'd wonder. I, mean, I tried to look at it, like, I tried to look at the film uh, how I used to see things as, 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 a, as a kid. Um, so would a member of staff go into that dumb waiter and maybe live? in the basement, are they making clothes in the basement? Uh, are bodily fluids from the mannequins um, being used as dye for the, for the clothes? Um, is the manager um, having an orgasm and is his sperm decorating the clothes? Is it drying and making a beautiful pattern? So it, it might sound preposterous, but bodily fluids on clothes, we all, all of us here are gonna end up with sweat or something on us and that's, 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 that's the, the, the haunting element of, of clothing, that um, the human contact with, with that. That was the, the starting point, really. Oh, yeah, uh, Ben, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, Rook Films is a company that Ben and I started to make Kill List, the film, the Wheatley film. So I've made, produced six films with Ben, I think. So that's Ben's role on, on this film. So it's, it's, a, it's a Rook production, so he's part of Rook. <laughs> I don't know where to begin. Like, if you run out of questions, just bring them <laughs> back because I could ask like for the whole day here. So, um, first of all, um, are these witches using the dress as a tool? I, I think I understood the movie, okay, but some things I missed, I think. So I will ask about some stuff about that. Um, are these witches uh, using the dress as a tool, or are the witches controlled by the dress? I mean, that's a question I shouldn't really answer. I mean, it, it could be both both ways, of course. Um, you know, it, it, there, there's, there's an element at the end of the film with the sweatshop where you can see just about there's a, a thread coming out of, of the character's veins. So there's this idea of blood and menstrual blood maybe acting as this kind of dye. Um, 
So really, um, the, the dress, it, uh, the, the important thing about the dress was it, it is random in its logic. Um, it, it's not judging the characters for being consumerists. I mean, they're not consumerists. Uh, if I was in Sheila's position, I would, I would, I would buy four dresses. Um, she, there's no reason why she shouldn't buy, buy, buy that dress. So uh, it was very important for me to have no judgment that the dress, it's like cancer. It's, there's no logic, it's random. It kills without any sense whatsoever. It's, 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 it's made and it's let loose. And the idea of the sales that basically get rid of it, it's gone. We're not gonna take it back. So whenever the dress appears back in the store, when Sheila tries to take it back, or when um, Babs turns up in the dress, it's, it's kind of this kind of abject item. It's, it is um, like fabric abjection, if, if you can say that. That once it's secreted out of the store, you don't want it back. It's gonna have its own life and kill again and again. We, we see the empty sweatshop rooms in the basement that more victims will appear. So really it was, yeah, it was, it was that element to it. Um, but yeah, you just see the elements of, of um, Miss Luckmore's character controlling the dress. When the dress is moving in the wardrobe, you can see her in the store having these spasms or seizures and the dress is moving accordingly. So uh, there is a hint that maybe the, the puppet mistress is actually Miss Luckmore, but it's not it wasn't something, something I wouldn't say explicitly. I, I can keep asking, but let other people, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. My name is Paul Katzenberger from Germany. Hello. And first of all, I wanted to congratulate you to this film. It's one of the most unique films I've ever seen. Thank you. And I uh, wish I could say the same, but thank you. <laughs> I just was wondering, why did you put in so much violence? I, I saw a lot, many people leave, and I think it was because they couldn't put up with the violence in the film. Why did you do, decide to have such violence? Well, it was always a thing. It was going to be a, I wouldn't say a ghost story, because there's no ghost as such. It, it's, it, it's a curse, but it was, it was coming from that genre. I mean, I do see it as, as a genre film to a degree, that um, the dress kills. Um, I mean, violence, I mean, people are killed. I wouldn't say they're murdered by other human beings. Um, but yeah, it was, um, that was the whole nature of the story, that it wreaks havoc. Um, it wouldn't be that film if there was no violence. It would well, it'd just be a very different kind of film. But yeah, it, it just kind of had to be that way. Um. <laughs> Curiosity, another, another issue, and that is to say why the film is divided into two parts and two narratives linked, quite clearly linked to the dress. That is to say, it could have been a film w that continued with the story of the first leading lady, that is to say, but you stop and then you go to the stag party. Why did you decide to, s uh, are there any reflections or rhymes between both parties? Could you explain how you split that up? That is to say, the first part where uh, the Marianne Jean Baptiste's character is the leading lady, and then all of a sudden you cut to the stag party. All right? Uh, it always had to be a chain of people. That was the number one thing. It was the idea of clothing. I mean, what I'm wearing is secondhand. So someone had this shirt before me, and who knows what they got up to. Um, I'd probably give it to a charity shop when this, is, when this shirt is finished. And, so I love the idea of the cyclical nature of, of, of clothing. So uh, um, I did a draft where I connected them more. I had Reg fix Marianne's washing machine. But the problem with that, it became too fatalistic. It became too logical that, oh, OK, it's all, there's, there's a connection. There's destiny. And I didn't want that. The, the very important thing was the, the, the terrifying randomness of, 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 of death. Then once you connect the characters, you lose that randomness. Um, so really, the, the important thing was to to live with Sheila, to for me to fall in love with her, um, to to all the characters. They might they all have flaws, of course they do. Um, but even Babs, who can be a bit feisty, I, I like her a lot. She's very loyal to to Reg. Uh, so yeah, the idea is the important thing for me was to regret killing them. If I 
found it easy to write that scene, it wouldn't be working. So it just had to live with them and almost see it like, 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 like a domestic drama with punctuated by this um, absurd device. Yeah, I think it's, re it's really interesting that the idea of killing the person off in the, you know, it's testament to it working how annoying it is when she dies. And I think when you think about that, like, in the moment, that's a very difficult thing to address. But I mean, it's like psycho, isn't it? You know. But when you think back on the film, it's actually extremely important that you like her enough to be disappointed when she's not in the film anymore. I mean, there's definitely no no judgment at all. Um, I, uh, yeah, it's. I want, uh, there, there's a background of consumerist culture, of course, with, you know, with, especially at the end, with, with the looting and the fighting, or the cues of people, but that, that is very much uh, a light-hearted, satirical um, observation. I didn't want to be doing this all the time, everyone, because I, I am a consumerist. I'm sure something I'm wearing, not this, but was made in a sweatshop somewhere in, in the world. So I, 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 don't, I don't want to be didactic. I don't want to be a hypocrite. Um, I mean, you could argue it is critical of consumerist culture, but you could also argue that it's a celebration of, of the high street, um, of um, shopping. I mean, I, I, I miss, <laughs> I mean, this is a different thing, but I miss buying DVDs in shops. You get, <laughs> you'd ask someone's opinion, you'd meet someone in the store, you go to a DVD shop now, it's like a ghost town, there's just no one there. I mean, I hate online shopping, I just, I don't want an algorithm recommending Jess Franco films to me. I want a person recommending Jess Franco. Hola. Hi. Hi, I'd like to ask you whether you were surprised that the film is in the official sec section and also I've been told that the project was for a series or because there's two stories there but the, you could have put in more characters uh, rotating and, and uh, with the, the address. And my finally, the inspiration, the way they're dressed, that is to say the sales reps, the, or the pers people, the, the sales people, uh, he refers to the, the girls, the witches, that some might call it. How did you, how do you, the dress, uh, the, how they were dressed, the costumes, how did that come? What was that inspired upon? Okay. Hope you got all those. Uh, are you, are you, are you, the first question is, no, 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 no. The first question was whether you're surprised that, that it's in the film festival. Are you surprised that you're in the section? Um, there were more characters, um, but there was not enough money to do that. So it was, it was tough doing it as it was. We only had 26 days. I mean, the more characters, the more locations, it became tougher. So. There was a choice, either we, we make it or we don't make it. So, um, um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's always the element that it can just continue. Um, it could end up like Police Academy, you know, with <laughs> seven sequels. Um, um, I'm, my apologies, sorry. Are well, what was surprised it was in selection? I am, I'm always surprised it gets anywhere. Um, yeah, I, I'm very pleasantly surprised. I mean, when you make a film, uh, Honest. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not trying to be fa falsely modest. I know I'm British, and we're very, you know, falsely modest. But when you make a film, you just have no idea whatsoever. Um, all you see is someone laughing at you in the crew because you got the wrong lens. That kind of stuff. You just see all the negative things. Maybe that's just my the way I am. But um, you just, yeah. <laughs> So no, I am, I am surprised, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't mean to be sycophantic, but it's interesting to me that a film like this can get into official selection here, which means the selection is about cinema, not about celebrities. And it's lovely, I mean, that's this, you know, to me, the film is, there's a lot of sort of pure cinema in the film, and that's why we like films, you know, they're not scripts and they're not, politics, they're not, they're, you know, they're a collision of sound and vision and create the thing why we're all here. And so it's wonderful to feel that something that is celebrating that can actually be showcased at this sort of festival, which is great. Um, eh, también, sorry, eh, could you repeat that? I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, it's not you, it's just... Um, <laughs> 
Yes, the sails, the characterization, the costumes of the ladies in the witches, in the, yeah, the witches, as he calls them, sales people, okay? Uh, the, yeah, wh where was the inspiration for that, for that, for the, for the, for the look and the costumes? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I just like that look. But it, it, it's, it was also, those department stores were always out of time. They were not like chain stores. It felt, the, the one I in, based this one on is, is a place called Jackson's in Reading. And it closed in 2013. And even in 2013, it felt like 1950. Um, we, we, we could have set this film now. The only reason I didn't was because I wanted the, that wonderful guessing and, and the anticipation of the Lonely Hearts before Tinder came along, where you can just see everyone's face. Uh, it was very important to, to have that guesswork. So I tried to push it as close to the edge of that as possible, which I guess it was 1993, and then I guess the internet took over afterwards. So the film is set in 1993, um, but it feels like the 70s because the stores had that 70s, 60s, 50s feel. Um, so really, it was working with Joe Thompson, who was a wonderful collaborator. She. Um, you know, showed me a lot of these outfits, which had this gothic feel. Um, and yeah, maybe that's where some of these films by, uh, I guess maybe Franco more than Argento um, came to mind, a lot of these vampire films. So yeah, I think it was just a lot of back and forth between, with, with, with Joe, Joe Thompson, and talking with Fatma, who plays Miss Lutmore. Um, I mean, she's always a collaborator, I always work with her. And yeah, just seeing, seeing what works, really. No, no. <laughs> en la primera fila. Hi, thanks. I'm not too sure whether any of the characters in the film free, free themselves from having some sort of fetish, apart from obviously the costume and the dress itself, but they got the son of the first protagonist with her drawings, the two characters listening to and, and being mesmerized by when they talk about the washing machine. Do you think we're all fetishists? Um, are you? <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, but the objects, I, I, I love working with objects. Maybe it's because you don't have to deal with agents, but um, I think what it is, it's, um, oh, there's an agent here, sorry. <laughs> um, it's, that thing that Schwankmeyer and the Quay brothers and Boone Well to some degree, Borovchik, Parajanov, they all understood there's this kind of alchemical power to, to objects. Um, and uh, yeah, for me, this is, this is absolutely, this is a, a fetish film, but not in the sexual sense so much. I mean, there, there, there's, a, there's an element of that. I mean, with Reg and his hosiery fetish, um, and it might be am amusing, the same way Babs with her body dysmorphia is amusing, but actually it's not amusing. I mean, she's haunted that she can't put on a dress and feel good about herself. She's always haunted by this. And Reg is haunted by, if he sees a woman wearing tights, it, it just creates this very deep longing in him. So it was a w trying to look at it affectionately, but also seriously at the same time. But really just clothing with, uh, depending on who, who wears the clothing. So Gwen's underwear disgusts Sheila. She picks it up and wants to throw it back in the bin. Vince can't wait to have his, he even wants his face printed on her underwear. That's how much he's in love with her bodily fluids. So it's, it's really, um, but the, 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 the fetish thing extends beyond that. It goes in, into sound as well with um, autonom autonomous sensory meridian response where you have this very, I wouldn't call it erotic, but it's this tactile response to certain sounds. So the film is very, very tactile. It's about texture, not just physical texture, but sonic texture. The fact that Reg, un being unaware of this, but he sends everyone into a trance. And it is absurd because I think a very small percentage of the population have this condition. But I think what I try to do in my films is taking something which is niche or a minority, but having all the characters have these fetishes. So in the Duke of Burgundy, everyone loves Saddle Massel. Um, in this film, everyone loves washing machine mantras. Um, 
to me, that's kind of beautiful. Um, sí, hola, buenos días. Hi, good morning. I've got different questions vis-a-vis -vis the costumes, which I thought was quite intriguing. The first of these is, obviously, I had seen that Joe, uh, Joe Thompson had developed it, but I would like to know how this work was done. Who was, how was the creativity and developing the costume, the costumes, what inspiration, or whether there has been inspiration for the red dress in any other dress or any classic dress of any specific designer, and whether you choose a specific type of fabric because the dress ha was very light and so on and so forth specifically, and I think it's great for the plastic side of things and the movement of the dress in, the f in those scenes. And on the other hand, what drew my attention was the Victorian aesthetics of Dracula with her, his concubines and so on. And I don't know whether it was a particular for reflection analogy with vampires and their structure and consumerism or whether on the contrary, it was more d uh, addressed to developing the gothic romantic aesthetics and dark aesthetics of evil. And then on the other hand, apart from the costumes, there's a moment that I would like you, you could give us a bit of a clue, albeit it's not necessary for you to do so, but the meaning of that moment in which the vampire, the protagonist, she gets introduced into the dead model through the, vag the vagina, through the mannequin. It was like going back, evil going back to its home because the uterus is like a house. I'm not too sure this is my interpretation of all of this or the truth be said, or wasn't necessary. I'm not too sure whether you can shed some light on everything that I've just said. Thank you very much. Uh, that was wonderful. <laughs> Um, very touched, thank you. Um, I love that idea of the uterus. And um, when I saw that scene as something quite beautiful, um, it's, it's menstrual blood, by the way. I know some people thought that she was being, she was wounded, she, uh, the mannequin was not wounded. Um, um, but go, going back to the dress, so with Joe, it was just a very long process of showing each other things we liked. Um, but the material was very important, and just purely, into, as you say, with, with, with movement, um, to have it undulating, to feel like some amoeba-like creature. Um, so chiffon and silk, that seemed the most adaptable for that, really. It had to be red, I mean, for obvious reasons. Um, again, harking back to the blood from whichever part of the body. Um, and the scar was very important for me um, because I don't know how successfully we managed this, but in the end of, of Sheila's story, you see the scar on her abdomen is exactly the same shape as the scar on the, on the dress in the same position. Um, originally, it was gonna be in a vagina, a vaginal, shape or configuration, I should say. Um, and I had a lot of problems with that. It felt very aggressive because she's gonna have a wound there and it felt, especially being a man, it just felt it's gonna give some very misogynist signals, which is, I didn't see this film in that way at all. So we quickly ditched that idea. So the, the, the design is much more abstract. Um, so in terms of how it, you know, it drapes around the body, I mean, that, that, that's Joe, really. I mean, she would show me stuff, and that, for me, that's more intuitive. I just say if I like it or don't like it. Joe has much more of an idea of, of why she, she's doing certain things. Um, and we try on the, the, the shop assistant's costumes are designed. There's a company in Britain called Sands who make a lot of, they, the woman who runs it directed Little Dorrit, the Dick, Dickensian, the Dickens adaptation. So they've got a kind of costume house, a theater, this in kind of incredible place that has, is just packed full of you know, Victorian, Dickensian, kind of amazing period costume. And they actually designed the stuff for the film in that specific place. Did I get everything? I'm not sure. Um. The mo yeah, the moment 
of when she puts that, the, that, the, the page into a, her vagina, when she rips it out of the book, what was that? <laughs> where was that going? Correct, that's where it went. Um, well, again, it's the idea of things coming out of the body, things coming back into the body. It um, it's becomes like another space, in a sense. Um, so, yeah, it's one of my favorite scenes, that one. Um, yeah. Don't look at me. <laughs> It's important for me to go. I, I never question what the director wants to do in the film. I mean, I'm a fan of films and I want the mystery and the magic and the illusion. And I, you know, I don't really care if I understand it or not. It's about making my brain percolate and thinking about it in the moment and next week and next year. And, and uh, you know, I, it's the magic to me is what it's all about. You know, I don't care about the you know, the standard narrative arc of things is just boring, you know, and I'm not interested in that at all. So I try and hopefully allow Peter to do what he does, and it's great to be in that world, you know, and that's that's the point of this stuff. It's unique, isn't it? And that's why it's good, I think, you know. I mean, it's always difficult to balance logic and mystery and it's always that push and pull between them. Um, a bit of mystery is fine. I mean, I'm not, when things get too abstract, I'm, I'm lost. But for me, this film had to be, there are mysterious elements that might not make sense, but to me, the whole film is grounded in things that I recognize in terms of um, domestic life, day-to-day, nine-to-five jobs, um, being a customer, serving customers, um, even the language, it might seem exaggerated, but I remember going to the job center a few years ago, bef like a year before I made Cotton Vargo, and I, there was an advert for a, 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 t a twilight replenishment operative. Um, I can answer the <laughs> nighttime shelf stacker. So, you know, the English love euphemisms, especially in retail and in the corporate world. And so I mean, to me, it, everything is like an elastic band. The house scenes are, the elastic band is, is, is relaxed, say, and Deadly and Sobers, we're stretching it as far as we can, but everything still connects to reality somehow. For me, um, the only strong illogical element is, is the dress killing people, uh, but everything else had to be grounded in some kind of reality to some degree, of course. Okay, vamos con la última pregunta. Yes, let's go with the last question. Simple question whether as a director you are completely satisfied with the film, with the result, and would you, would you have made any changes if you could have, if you could have after having seen the film and, and, and edited it the way it is and the way we've seen it on the screen? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I don't think any director is satisfied with what they do. Um, there are moments where I'm very happy. Um, I thought the mannequin scene with the washing, I thought we really, all of us, all elements came together really nicely. Um, there was an intensity there. But even that, when I look back on it, I remember when we were shooting it, we, we couldn't um, control the sound from upstairs. There was a, a working shop above us. And um, I don't know if you remember um, Tarzan Boy by Baltimore. It's this kind of 80s pop hit. But when Fatma was licking the menstrual blood, this chorus from Tarzan Boy came through the floorboards. and. So it's just this very incongruous element going on. So I guess my mind always goes back to these things on set. So um, I mean, everything I do, I would change it. Um, but it comes to the point where you just have to just let it go. And um, no, I mean, everything I do is flawed. It's imperfect. And um, it will always be like that, sadly, <laughs> you know. Um, but that, that, that's why I keep going, because we didn't get something right. <laughs> and we'll try and make it right in the next film, but then we get something else wrong, and it just continues. I'm completely happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, pues, uh, si os parece, lo dejamos. Okay, that's it. A big round of applause for this great party of a film.